But I'm curious, just to kick it off, uh, if any, whoever wants to start, what's your thought on why men appear to be failing? I assume we were going in order of who was introduced first, but uh, all right, I'll be like the based alpha male and assert myself into the conversation <laughs> early on, I suppose. I think uh, it's probably because we just aren't taught how to be men. I mean, traditionally, men would be taught how to sort of grow into their masculinity by their fathers, grandfathers, uncles. Uh, but now we have a very, I think, androgynous and weak society because of things like you mentioned with um, testosterone going down because of different lifestyle factors, things they're putting in the food, uh, things even in the water is like residual birth control. I think like estrogen in the water, but also I think our society doesn't really incentivize positive channeling of those behaviors. You know, typically if you are a man, you're going to want to like impose your will upon the world in some capacity, whatever that may be. But if you can't do that, you're going to turn that inward and self-destruct, or you're going to try to distract yourself from that drive naturally with things like maybe drugs, video games, uh, masturbation, pornography. And so I think that's kind of what we're seeing just because men haven't really been taught by their fathers who they're largely absent from their lives in the first place now how to actually be a man and now people don't even know what that means like if you ask someone how to be a man and even you look in like the, in the red pill community they'll say well being a man is like you know having sex with lots of women and smoking cigars and drinking whiskey <laughs> and it's like this caricature it's like a costume of like what masculinity actually is and so no one really has a clear definition of it because I don't think the definition is actually that interesting like if you'd go back a hundred years and be like how do I be a man it's like I don't know just like do it it's supposed to be something that happens naturally and I think that as our society has devolved, we've had so many impediments introduced that prevent people from doing that naturally. They think they have to like reinvent it into some really complex thing. You have to take these courses and read these books. I mean, that's not the case. You should really be able to just kind of develop into it, I think. I wonder if it had something to do in the past with survival mm. in that uh, men fought wars, put out fires, were hunting and things like that. And as we've advanced as a civilization in terms of uh, technology, survivability has become less and less of an issue for us. We have too much food now. And so is there really going to be this manly man who's super ripped with a big beard chopping down trees? Or is it going to be some beer belly guy driving around in a heavy machinery who just presses a button and has it done for him? So, you know, we have this traditional view of masculinity with these heroic images of men that we don't need as much anymore. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. I think that it's still possible, though, for men to be heroes, even in this like post-industrial society. But I think they're prevented from doing so. I mean, even like in school nowadays, boys can't stand up for themselves on the playground because they have like zero tolerance policies, which teach kids that like violence is absolutely never something that's permitted. So if some kid's picking on you and you fight back, you are now going to be suspended as well. Um, you also have things like they're bringing these social workers and counselors to try to tell boys that like if you have a problem, you have to talk about it and there's probably something wrong with you. They even try to turn their the, the students like against their parents in some cases. If kids are like, you know, my mom destroyed my Lego set because she was mad at me. A whole Lego set destroyed? That was something I remember happening to one of my buddies when I was in elementary school. So I think it's like taking children and basically teaching them to be a cog in that system that you described without saying, you know, you can climb to the top. You can be a hero. You can still do things that are noble even if you're not, you know, protecting your community from Indians. You can protect them from criminals. But now the law has made that largely impossible in many cases as well, I think. Well, most of the institutions that young men interact with are run by women. If we look at the education system, it is a more feminine view. And the way that little girls learn and little boys learn, it's not the same. And it's not that one's better than the other. But I feel like that, in addition to the fact that social workers, for example, overwhelmingly female, psychologists, psychiatrists, overwhelmingly females, there are so many women who I think have the best intention when it comes to shaping men's lives, but I think they're not realizing that men and women are different. So that masculine leadership that you were talking about, that's largely missing and it's been replaced with either nothing or maybe too much of a feminizing influence. What do you think? I don't think men and women are that different. Um, I do agree with one thing that was said, though. I think one of the big issues you run into is there's literally no good advice out there for how to, I guess, help men. Because it seems like on the left, they just don't want to talk to men at all. They're just exclusively talking to women or maybe minority men. Um, and then for people on the right, it's this very strange caricature of masculinity. It's funny because you pointed out like that the red pill talks about a caricature of masculinity. But I feel like sometimes conservatives talk about caricatures of masculinity, too. Um, I feel like when we talk about masculinity, everybody wants to talk about like the really sexy, like fighting the kid at at lunch that yes. broke your Legos or <laughs> fighting with your parents or whatever. The reality is, and I say the same shit to red pillars who say, well, it's important for you to be masculine because somebody breaks into my house. I need to get my assault rifle and tell my woman to hide my... Like, life, 99% of life is not these moments. Like, how you, successful you are in life really comes down to, like, can you maintain a sleep schedule? Can you have a decent diet? Do you have enough discipline to go to work, show up to your job? 
can you graduate school? Like these are not only are these like the most important, they're oftentimes the hardest ones. It's a lot harder to maintain a 4.0 GPA, get a scholarship, go to school than it is to stand up to a bully one time on the playground. But it seems like those are the sexy like moments that everybody wants to obsess over. And then in the meantime, when you look at like the, the woman's side of things, women have been taught to have more control over reproductive health. They're taught to go to school and succeed in ways that we never thought they could before. They're taught to enter the job market and get jobs and make money in ways we never thought they could before. Um, Women have been doing a good job at kind of like leveling up all these different aspects of their lives. Nobody wants to talk to the men on the left and the people that are talking to the men from the right are like, well, you guys just need to be even more masculine, even though I don't see any future where just being even more masculine is equipping you to succeed in a world where your outcomes are largely determined by like how successful you could be at a white collar office job or how successful you could be sitting down, you know, eight hours a day in a school setting like in college. I suppose that's true. I don't know if while it does seem sort of silly when you lay it out that way to focus on, you know, these heroic standards as opposed to what is more practically applicable. It is true, though, that like even when men do go down those paths and they do them successfully, they don't feel fulfilled. They don't feel happy. They feel very, you know, inundated and restless. And I think that's partially why the male suicide rate is like unprecedentedly high, because, yes, they are checking these boxes and they're living successfully as determined by how society might want that to be defined, but they still do not feel like they're living as men. I mean, even, you know, for example, if there were a guy who were making good money at a job, white collar, and he steps outside his office to go get into his Mercedes and he gets like robbed by somebody who doesn't have a gun. They just like beat the shit out of him. Wait, can I swear? I don't remember. I don't remember the rules here. <laughs> I don't um, know if we have any. I don't know. Uh, he's going to feel like emasculated. You're going to feel bad about yourself because you were unable to defend yourself. And especially if his girlfriend or if his wife sees that, I don't care how much feminist literature she has read. If your woman ever sees you get beat up by another guy, she's never going to look at you the same way. I don't care how understanding she says that she is. Oh, he was bigger than you, whatever. She will never look at you the same way again, because whether or not we like it, they have been wired biologically to seek out men who can protect them. Even if now they don't necessarily need the financial stability that maybe they would have required, you know, a hundred years ago, they still have that instinct to pursue that. And so, I think that those moments too. I mean, how many guys too I, I, I just, are I, now living in the glory day, or um, living in like this very comfortable lifestyle who still reminisce upon, uh, back to when they were like the captain of the football team or back, you know, in their glory days or even like post traumatic stress disorder? I mean, properly understood, we learned this in Vietnam. It's not like guys are so traumatized by war. It's that they go and they experience that brotherhood and that glory and they come back and they're like in a box. I mean, the Hurt Locker actually explored this very well. You read the interviews from like after Vietnam, these soldiers are coming back. It's not just that they're traumatized, it's that life after war is boring. So I think there is something in the male brain that's wired to pursue that. There's okay, lots of so, uh, yeah, a few things. So one, that <laughs> PTSD is absolutely not. I was with my brothers and then I came back. Um, that I, I don't think that is a driving factor of PTSD. I think a driving factor of PTSD is the human uh, central nervous system being stressed beyond whatever a human is meant to deal with in life and death situations for sometimes extended periods of time, um, sometimes with other physiological things lacking too, like sleep, diet, whatever. That, But regardless of that, again, we hit on the, there's another red pill talking point, like what is a woman looking for in a man? Protection. Like, where do you live? Is this like in Pakistan or are we like in some civil war place? Like we live in the United States of America. I don't think protection is the thing that like most people probably want a guy that earns a decent paycheck. Um, but is, is that not financial protection? Yeah, but that's not the protection that he was talking about, <laughs> right? You, if, if you want to broaden protection to be so overly broad and meaningless that it includes things like making money, you can do that. But when people say protection, I mean, he was talking about like, if your wife sees you get beaten up, blah, blah, blah. Like True. if we take the totality of divorces and relationships ending in the United States right now, it's like saw my husband get beat up, is that even going to make the top 50? <laughs> I'm guessing it's, it's probably nowhere near on that list. It's a similar <laughs> impulse in the brain, though, because I think women are initiating something between like two-thirds and 80% of divorces, and largely they just cite that they feel unfulfilled. I think that can manifest in a variety of ways, but I think it's like they're looking at their husbands as less attractive for whatever reason. Well, that's, You can even see studies, too. Women that earn more than their husbands in a long enough timeline are more likely to divorce them because they don't have that traditional perceived ability to, like she mentioned, protect financially. But I agree with Wait, wait, real quick, hold on. Neither of those two things are completely true. Number one, the divorce rate gets cited a lot. There's a reason why women overwhelmingly initiate divorce versus men. And that's because oftentimes women have more to that they need to secure by doing so. If a man and a wife get together and things, you know, better out or whatever, things don't work out, especially if the woman is a child, that woman has to file for divorce. If she wants to qualify for benefits, if she wants to get any kind of child support, if she wants to get any kind of welfare, otherwise her husband's income is constantly going to be taken into account when she's trying to apply for any assistance or need. So women are oftentimes highly incentivized to get divorced because a man can be like married and 
not give a fuck forever. Socially, there's probably less stigma, like, oh, I'm separated from my wife, she's whatever, versus a woman being like, well, I'm still married, but I don't see my husband. So socially, there's a lot of stigma behind um, who would call this, who cause a divorce. And then for uh, financial benefits, a woman with a child whose husband is no longer in the picture and not helping, she absolutely needs to file for that divorce in order to qualify for anything she might need to maintain a household. Um, number one. Um, number two, after the divorce thing, you brought up the, what was the second thing? Oh, shoot. I don't even remember. Um, fuck, was it the protection thing? Fuck, I lost Probably. it. But the number one thing was, yeah, not, yeah. Well, so I, I just, quick Google search, mm -hmm. singular source, Forbes advisor uh, says that lack of commitment is the uh, pr primary reason for divorce. 75% of individuals cited lack of commitment, 60% cited infidelity. So Damn. it seems like infidelity is the real reason for divorce, which kind of sounds like if either individual in the relationship is cheating on each other, they've already Right. They've so, already broken their relationship. I mean, this is. is something I'll push back at the 80% of women filing for divorce. I think there's a difference between a woman filing for divorce and a woman being responsible for the divorce. If it's a case of infidelity specifically, a man can cheat and a woman can file for divorce because of that. But can you really blame the woman for the marriage failing in that case? I don't think so. But I think lack of commitment here is defined separately from infidelity. Um, lack of commitment could be like, you know, he's not bringing to the table what I thought he was, something like that. These sort of like vague reasons that are hard to define. Infidelity, I would agree with, but I mean, it does but, say like 75 percent would be I want to I want to I want to ask that question what causes infidelity could it be sexual uh, you know uh, uh, desires that a man has or a woman has they're not being fulfilled with or could it be that something in their relationship already broke where an attraction has waned for a variety of reasons which resulted in them seeking there's probably one a variety of reasons one of why it's monogamy See if everybody had open relationships, there'd be no more infidelity. Boom. That's, Next topic. That's just like saying if we if we it's make like, all crime legal, there'll be no more crime. Yeah, okay. Have you seen the purge? Uh, okay. <laughs> Their world is better off for it, according to the lore. So.